Wir müssen mich jetzt da raus. Ich gehe raus. Oh. Damit bei Süße sitzen. Okay, Julian, Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Um, how many of you attended the first lecture? Because I'm okay. So just briefly for those of you who are not here, this is a two-part presentation on two subjects to do with metaphysics, magic, spirituality, and religion that I would say are the two perhaps, well, not the only, but two of the most misunderstood aspects of the spiritual world. And the first one that I addressed was the false idea of this phrase, the left-hand path. And for the, if you forgive me, those of you who were at the first lecture, let me briefly make something clear. Um, again, how many of you have heard the phrase links hang fad, or left hand path? So to, to get to the essence of what I said before, because it is directly connected to the subject of this second part of the lecture, speaking generally, in the Western occult and esoteric world, the false impression has been created that the phrase left-hand path means Satanism, black magic, the devil, or some sort of malevolent magical force. Or at the very least, um, some Luciferian so-called groups use the left-hand path to mean about individualism, selfishness, etc. It does not mean any of that. That's the first thing I have to say. And as you heard in lecture one, basically the left the phrase left hand path comes from a Sanskrit phrase, Vama Marga, which means the way of the left, the way of women, and it only has a meaning etymologically in Hinduism and Buddhism, which is the lineage and tradition from which the real phrase left-hand path comes from. And briefly, it is because of Western occultists who did not understand the true authentic lineage of Tantra and of the left-hand path. Um, Madame Blavatsky and Theosophy, Aleister Crowley and the OTO and Astrum Argentinum, the Order of the Golden Dawn, the Church of Satan, and other modern Satanists that were even less informed than those first people have given a false idea that the left-hand path means Satanism, black magic, etc. So just that's a very brief summing up of what I talked about in the first lecture. Now we come to perhaps one of the most misunderstood figures in, in the West when it comes to religion. Satan, Lucifer, the devil. What is really the devil? What is really Satan? What is Lucifer? Um, the ideas that most of us have, as I've explained in my book, The Satanic Screen, which is available in German as Lucifer's Leinwand. In the introduction of the German edition, I explain in great detail what is the devil, really. Uh, and, and going into biblical scholarship and far beyond popular Western occultism, what is the devil? And those of you who know something of my biography know that from my earliest youth, I was myself a devil worshiper. And I used that phrase, Teufel Anbeter, rather than Satanismus, because Satanism has wrongly also somehow weirdly 
uh, is used just to describe atheism with diabolical symbolism. And that is never anything I did or believed in. That, that doesn't even make any logical sense. So first of all, when I speak of Satanism, I'm talking about belief in an actual spiritual being that exists, that has a, a sovereign intelligence and intention. It's not merely a symbol or an artistic expression or some folklore um, being, but an actual being. And I know I'm not talking theoretically or in an abstract or philosophically. I know from personal experience the devil exists. This being that is called the Satan. In Hebrew, the phrase Hasatan is used in the Old Testament. So let us look at the names of Satan and the devil first. This is a way to understand it. It is popularly misreported that the name Satan means adversary. Have some of you heard that idea? Yeah, so what it really means, if you, if you translate the phrase properly, Hasatan, the Satan, first of all, it is not his name. It's not like you knock on his door and say, are you there, Satan? It's, it's a title. We, he doesn't have a name, this being. It's actually a title of an office. And so to understand what, what the name means, it actually doesn't mean adversary. And a lot of people have the idea that Satan is a rebel, that he is a counterforce to Yahweh or God or Allah or Jehovah, whatever word you wish to use for that being. He is not. And this is perhaps the essential thing I could explain in all of my research and, and scholarship and trying to understand this being, this being the Satan is a minor servant of Yahweh, the God that Satanists believe they are fighting by being a Satanist, which frankly is ridiculous. It would be like, it would be like thinking the local policeman, by working with him, you would be working against the government. So, the Satan is God's representative, Yahweh's representative. And if you look at the Bible, it's even, even though a lot of what is in the Old Testament and New Testament was left out, and we can find it in the Nag Hammadi documents, the so-called Dead Sea Scrolls, the Gnostic texts, if you really read the Bible, it is clear that the Satan is working for God. He is not working against him. So one of the first things I want to make clear, Christians who don't really understand their own religion have demonized this being who is actually God's representative. So what, in, in my personal opinion, having had experience, with this being, and I'm admitting I was wrong about what this being was. I'm speaking from the experience. It's like if you got to know somebody and you find out they are not what they appear to be. Why, why is there this misimpression that the devil is the adversary of God, that the devil is some like anti-God, some gigantic evil, benevolent force that is the opposite of God. When in fact, if we look at biblical sources and the actual Middle Eastern lineage of, these, of this tradition, he is clearly one of God's most faithful lieutenants. So in the Bible, let's, let's look at the different stories. I, I, as I said in the first lecture, asking for audience participation from a German audience is a doomed enterprise in the beginning, but, we'll, but just to torture you, I'm going to do it. Ken, two or three of you, what, is, what are the stories in the Bible that you believe are connected to the devil off the top of your head? Does anyone 
think of what are the most famous stories connected with this being the devil. Anybody? Temptations of Jesus Christ. Temptations of Jesus Christ in the desert. Okay. All right. So he's saying the, the temptation of Jesus in the desert. And I'm going to look. Because the Bible, the Old Testament, and the Quran, which we will get into, are basically three different perspectives on the same Middle Eastern religious lore that is very ancient. So this gentleman mentioned the incident when Jesus Christ starts to realize that he is the Son of God. He goes out to the desert and he encounters at the peak of his religious awareness this being that is referred to as the Satan. And actually, to, to, to ground this in something personal, and I've mentioned this in some interviews that you can find online, my personal initiation into this Satan and the devil, when I was very young, I had a babysitter, very, very young, and she allowed me to stay up to watch the film Dracula, the early 1931 film, which in America, these films were only shown very late at night so the children can see them. And in that film, Renfield, who is Dracula's disciple, there's a scene you may remember, and it's in Bram Stoker's novel, in which Renfield is describing Dracula, and he says that he said to him, all these things will I give you if you serve me. And that phrase Bram Stoker took from the Bible. The devil, that is exactly what the devil says to Jesus Christ in the desert, as he mentioned. So the devil comes to Jesus, and he says, I will give you women. And Jesus says, no. I will give you all the wisdom in the world. I'll give you all these secret books that will tell you everything about the secrets and mysteries of the universe. Jesus says, no. I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. You can be a world ruler. You can rule everything. Jesus says, no. And he says, get thee behind me, Satan. And he rejects Satan. And, and that's it. It's a very brief thing. But what is really happening there it is not, if we understand what I mentioned earlier, the devil is like a narcotics officer checking to see that people are obeying the rules. He, he's like the Stasi or the Gestapo for God. He's, he's testing you by saying, well, oh, don't you want women? Don't you want knowledge? Don't you? He's testing it. And as you said, temptation, versuchum is what he's trying to do. He's, he's trying to see, are you loyal to God by offering you these sinful and worldly things? He doesn't, he's not trying to encourage you to be evil. He's just, it, uh, the comparison I make in Lucifer's line bond and in a book I'm writing that will be coming out about this subject, it's like a mafia boss who sends a thug to a store to say, well, what do you think of the Tataglia family? You like them, right? You know, he's testing to see, are you loyal to the mafia? He's, he's a thug. He's like a lowly thug that God sends to test your religiousness, to make sure you are devoted. And now we have to take a moment to look at Satan's boss, is the real problem here. This is a God, Yahweh, who creates supposedly these two beings, Adam and Eve, and immediately this creation fucks up badly because Eve eats an apple, which is actually a pomegranate in the original translation. So he's such an incompetent God, he creates these beings that immediately disobey him, and then all of humanity has a sin for all time because this woman ate the forbidden fruit. And not long after that, humans are not worshiping him sufficiently. So he kills everybody with a flood, except for Noah and a few animals. 
And then they're still not good enough. I mean, in Egypt, he kills babies, this supposedly good God. The firstborn children of Egypt are all killed because, again, nobody's worshiping this being sufficiently for him. So he, he recommends that the chosen of God can kill other people, cheat them, slaughter them, rape their women, rip babies from their wombs. This is all in the Bible. That, that's what the good God is telling people to do. And then, finally, he's so sick of people not worshiping him properly, he rapes a human woman, she has a son, and then he kills him. So that's the good God, that is Yahweh. In my opinion, and this is from the lineage of Gnosticism, Yahweh is an evil being. The, the God that the Jews, Christians, and Muslims worship is in himself a narcissistic, destructive being, you know, who, who, if you look at what he, his, the, its own religion teaches you, that he says is like a psychopathic murderer whose only interest is being worshipped. Worship me or I'll kill you. It, it's like the worst kind of tyranny. So if the Satan is this being's assistant, he's also not to be trusted. He's, he's just testing you. So. Another less familiar, can, can anyone else think of one other story about the devil that is popularly known? The Book of Draw, where he yeah, has yeah. this bet. The Book of Draw, where he has this bet with Hiob that he will, he will betray God's name if he, if he takes the blessings of God away from him. And right. So, on. Right. so this, this fits into the testing narrative. Exactly, you know? yes. So mm -hmm. the gentleman here mentioned the Book of Job in the Bible, and, and this always baffles me. Here it is, it shows the Satan talking to God as clearly a friend, an ally, and he says, I don't like how this job is behaving on earth. Let me go down there and test him. And that's what he does. Exactly as this supposedly good God, Yahweh, says to Abraham, the founder of these three religions, as a prank, Oh, kill, kill your son. Show me how loyal you are. Kill your son. And, and, he, and Abraham's about to sacrifice his own child. And then God says, no, no, I was just kidding. Just test him and see if you're loyal to me. Who in their right mind would want anything to do with this being? God, Yahweh, Jehovah. So alternately then, why would you want anything to do with the Satan? which is not an opponent or a rebel or an adversary or anything like that. He is his most loyal assistant. So that was a good example because the book of Job shows, again, as he does later with Jesus, the Satan comes to tempt you, to test you. And another story from the Bible that when I've given this lecture before, the serpent in the Garden of Eden Briefly, let's discuss that. Many, I think many hundreds of years after the Bible was put together, a council basically took this story of a serpent that comes and tells Eve, the supposed first woman, to eat this forbidden fruit. But that story goes back to Babylon, Mesopotamia. It, it is a much older um, myth, myth cycle than Christianity and Judaism and Islam, which that story is part of all three of those religions. But again, there is no reason to believe that that snake or serpent is the devil or Satan. There's absolutely no proof of it. But you will always see imagery of the devil as this hissing serpentine figure who's tempting womankind into evil. And again, so we can dismiss that. The serpent is not the devil. So basically, if you really... And then, and then you, have, um, you have at the end of the Bible, the, the Revelations, which is a, probably the last part of the Bible, written much later in the so-called 
apocalyptic period. And there you have John, the author, the purported author of Revelation, says that at the end of time, when Jesus returns, that it says that old serpent, the devil, will be you know thrown into this abyss. And that's it. It's like a sentence. And that's just a much later interpretation. And, and to explain that, there is a word theodicy, T-H-E-O-D-I-C-Y, which means how do these three religions make sense of, of this monstrous, destructive, murderous God that they're saying is a God of light and love and good? Why is there evil in the world? And basically the Catholic Church in its early days said, well, Let's take this minor figure who's mentioned here and there and turn him into this supervillain. He's responsible for all the evil in the world. It's not God. Even though in the Bible, God says, I created the light and the darkness, and he does take credit for everything. So basically, the Catholic Church invented the idea, let's, let's blame it all on this Sundenbok, this scapegoat, the Satan. They took a minor figure and turned him into this colossal enemy of Christianity. At a time, remember, when until Martin Luther translated the Bible into German, most Germans could read the Bible. Uh, it, so you had to take the word of what the Catholic Church told you. So this minor figure was turned into this super demonic supervillain but it's just not the case. Um, now, so most of you are familiar with the Old and New Testament. I want to mention one other misnomer about the name of the devil or Satan. Lucifer, a lot of contemporary occultists and magicians speak about Satan being one being and Lucifer being another. You may have heard people saying, I'm a Luciferian rather than a Satanist. Or there are others who say, no, it's the same being. This is a simple mistranslation that when Europeans translated the Bible from Aramaic and these ancient Middle Eastern languages, they didn't know the languages well enough to translate them properly. So you've, one story none of you mentioned is that the devil supposedly has this battle in heaven with St. Michael and then he's thrown out of heaven. This is all based largely on one phrase in the, in the Old Testament in which it says, Lucifer, how thou art fallen from heaven. And we know now from biblical histo historical research, they were using the word Lucifer, which means shining one. In the ancient times, that was connected to the star Venus which were the planet Venus, which is the brightest star in the firmament, and it was connected to the Jews, to Venus and Ishtar and, the, and these goddesses that they hated because the three Abraham religions hate any worship of the female or of goddesses. So they're basically this comment, Lucifer, was who, who is it falling? We now know it was just a minor Mesopotamian king who had fallen out of favor and because the Jewish people that wrote the Old Testament hated the tyranny of the, of the Mesopotamian rulership, they're basically saying, they're making fun of the fall of a king. It's got nothing to do with the devil. And so this word Lucifer just means shining one. It's saying, look how bright you shine and now you've fallen. The Catholic Church later, you know, embellished the story into Lucifer fell from heaven and blah, blah, blah. There's no, there's no actual real reason to believe that that's part of the myth. It was talking about a political figure that was disliked at the time. So about another interesting thing about the word Lucifer, there are hymns in the Catholic Church today in which Jesus Christ is referred to as Lucifer, the shining one, the bright one. So, 
Listen, there is no, there, there is a minor Roman god named Lucifer because the Romans had a god for everything. So there was a god of light and he was called Lucifer. But that is not the devil, that is not Satan. And this Lucifer mentioned in the Bible is not. So I hate to burst the bubble of Luciferians and Satanists and Christians, but this is just a misunderstanding a mistranslation of ancient texts to create an agenda, to create an evil being that you can say, I am all good and that being is bad, or Satan is saying, I am, you know, in some rebellious way, I am good rebelling against the evil God. So that's, I could go into much deeper explanation of this, but that's the basics. And then I want to end Actually, some of the most instructive understanding of how wrong the Western world has got Satan, Lucifer, the devil, comes from Islam. And very few Western people have looked at the Quran, but the Quran comes a lot closer to what I'm talking about. And interestingly, in esoteric Islam, which is called Sufism, you will find the almost positive feeling of the devil, Iblis, which Ibl Iblis is what Satan is known in the Islamic world that is connected to our Western word Diabolus, meaning basically a deceiver. Diabol Diabolus means an untrustworthy person or being. So Iblis is the Islamic name for the devil. In the Quran, the explanation for what happens is that Allah creates mankind, Adam and Ifa, as they're known in Arabic, Adam and Eve, and there is a race of angels, a race of jinn, who are beings made of fire, and there is the race of humans that, that Allah creates. And when Allah makes Adam and Eve, his most, this is the way the Quran describes it, his most loyal disciple is Iblis. He says he loves Allah, and he says, Lord, these beings made of clay are not good enough for you. I don't trust them. I don't like them. Let me test them for you. Let me make sure that they are good enough. I, I don't, I, he, and, and Allah says to his angels and seraphim, bow down to Adam and Eve, this new creation, and only this one jinn, Iblis, says, no, I will not. And so they make a deal, Iblis and Allah. Allah says, all right, go to earth and test these new creations. So that's exactly what we see in the Old Testament with Job, with Jesus, is this tester. And, you know, so it's in all three religions, if you really look at them, in the Old Testament when Jesus is tempted in, no, rather in the, in the New Testament where Jesus is tempted in the desert, as he mentioned when Job is tested in the Old Testament and in the Quran, again, this is, there are no more famous books than those three. How many people have really read them, looked at them, and understood them? So most of your ideas of what Satan and the devil is, frankly, comes from Hollywood horror movies, um, Dante's Inferno, which is where the idea came. There is no uh, biblical support for the idea that there is a hell that the devil rules over and where, where you are sent to be tormented by the devil, that Satan runs hell and God runs... That's not in any of the religious teachings. That is from, from Dante's Inferno, and it's also from another work of literature, Paradise Lost, by John Milton, which is one of the most famous English poems, in which Satan is almost given a kind of heroic, rebellious image. But people who don't know anything really about religion or mysticism or have any encounter with supernatural beings. You, basically, these ideas come from fiction, from horror movies, as I explained in my book, The Satanic Screen. Most of what you think you know about Satanism or the devil 
comes from fiction, from literature. The real thing, the real Satan, he exists, and I, I have encountered it, and I was wrong in my youth to, to misinterpret it, so that's why I think I feel a moral obligation to explain to people it's not true. So if you're a Satanist, you are basically a Judeo-Christian uh, worshiping a being that is part of Yahweh or Jehovah. It may, it may make you feel good to think you're being rebellious, but if you care about what is true, it's not true. So that is a general overview of why we so incredibly, almost completely misunderstand Satan, Lucifer, the devil. And if any of you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Any question at all? Okay. Thanks a lot, Sas. That was very interesting. And I see your point about the testing, but I mean, there's lots of Luciferians and lots of Satanists. I'm not one of them, but I can also kind of see their point. As if you look at these stories of uh, Job and of uh, the, the snake in the, in the garden and the Jesus, I mean, if, if you want to interpret this as this is a being who is opposed to God and who wants to lead people to freedom, yeah, Lux Fere, the light bringer, right. who wants to... Um, but yeah, who wants to the people to know good from in evil? Mm -hmm. Why why is this a worse interpretation? Well, it, it, like, like the standard Catholic interpretation that this being is completely evil and malevolent. Well, when I was you know in my teens or twenties, I would have probably thought what you're saying that God is a tyrant and therefore this being is a rebel against this tyrant. But there's, there's, well, there's no grounding for it. It's just an interpretation. It's wishful thinking. Like political leftists like Garibaldi took the devil as a positive symbol. Um, and, and actually that's another thing we have to touch on is he has been used as a symbol of rebellion for political reasons very often. But yeah, it's a valid interpretation, but it's like interpreting a poem. There is nothing in the actual religious literature that supports this idea at all. It's, you know, Madame Blavatsky and Theosophy took this idea that Lucifer is the brain. It's, it's, it's taking little grains of fact, like, oh, he's connected to light, therefore he's the bringer of light. If there's no... There's nothing valid about it. You can interpret anything anyway. You know, I just don't, there's no, if you care about facts, there's no real grounding to that. In the literature, but what, what about uh, the people's evocations and invocations? I don't know. I well, don't, well, they're, 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 they hear what they want to hear. Well, there's a phrase in English, barking up the wrong tree. Go here. If, you know, you're, you're going to a loyal lieutenant of Yahweh and complaining about Yahweh. It's stupid, actually. So you can do all these involved demonic, poetic rituals, but they're mistaken. And when you're dealing with any supernatural being, it's very important to know who is it, what is it. They have their own agenda. They have their own beliefs. If you, if you want to go to war, you wouldn't invoke Venus. Uh, if you're looking for a date, you would not invoke Mars, for instance. That, that's the equivalent of what's being done with that. So I can take two more questions or observations or whatever anyone may care to say. Anybody? It's just two more, then I will have to cut it short. Uh, so you can make it an incredibly long question. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first thing I would like to point out is... Okay. Yeah. Uh, the first thing I would like to point out is it's very hard to speak with these teeth. Yeah. So, forgive me for, if I'm not well understood. It's fine. Um, so you said that Stoker took that from, from the Bible. Um, that's an interesting story, actually. Um, so 
Yeah, that's a great sentence. That way of um, seducing Greenfield does not exist in the book. It was something that Hollywood added to it, as it comes from a country that's very Catholic or very Christian, and so they took the words of the devil and put it into Dracula. I believe it is. I believe it is in Stoker's novel. We'd have to check. I I don't recall I mean, it. He, he, Stoker. This is actually National Dracula Day, World Dracula Day today. Yeah, I mean, I don't recall it. Oh. Yeah, so, so somebody should find a copy. But I believe he definitely tried to associate Satan. Yes, definitely, he did. For that example, specific for instance, sentence. I, I, he, was, he wasn't as ham-fisted as I Hollywood. Think, I think so. We're going to have to check on that. Just, you, so, I can be wrong. Just, right, if you prove me wrong, that's yeah, it. We can all be wrong. So I will um, check that, and then I'll put as an addendum to this video what the truth of that was. But I okay. believe Renfield says that to Van Helsing in the book. We'll check. Uh, so the other thing was about Jesus. Um, and it goes back to the idea of rebelling against God, as you say, and how wrong it is to claim to worship Satan as rebelling against God. So there is a theological... Um, interpretation, which I think is valid, that Jesus denied his own father. Mm -hmm. That's why he was abandoned. It, it wasn't the God that might be narcissistic. I mean, that, that's a whole new discussion. <laughs> right. um, it wasn't, he didn't sacrifice Jesus. We did. Mm -hmm. Period. That, that was our decision. Mm -hmm. And the reason he allowed it to happen was because Jesus denied his father. Jesus himself no, that is an interpretation. Jesus himself said of the Old Testament, forget everything. This is my word. This is how I want you to be, how kind I want you to be. There's only one right. uh, one commandment, which is love one another, whatever. This, if you say this to people, if it, Jesus never said anything about worshiping his father. I mean, he said, yeah, you can pray to him for adoration. You can ask of him things, but he never said, you know, worship him as the almighty creator. Right. In fact, he said, you could argue he said the opposite. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, worshiping, people who worship Jesus, something like the Quakers or the Mennonites, who worship Jesus as a being of uh, gratefulness, as a being of love itself, and don't pay too much attention to what the Father said and what the Old Testament said, right. that itself is the true rebel religion, if you think about it. Right. Okay. Okay. So what is your interpretation of this? Yeah. Yeah. For my personal practice and opinion, the teaching of Christ, of Jesus Christ, which again, like Satan, uh, his father's name was not Christ. Um, you know, he didn't have a carpentry company named Jesus Christ Carpentry. It is a title, Iusus Christus the Savior, the Anointed One. It, it's not the name of Jesus anymore, and Satan is the name of this being. Um, you are correct, there is an interpretation in many Christian uh, belief systems that Jesus is not the Son of Yahweh, in fact, and that is what I lean to. Is that if you look at the teachings in the New Testament of what Jesus says, to, they are the complete opposite of what his supposed father is doing. In the Old Testament, he's recommending kill everybody who doesn't worship me properly, destroy them, rape them, do whatever. Uh, and Jesus is saying, love your, love your neighbor, compassion, ultimate kindness, non-dualism. I, and this gets into a whole other subject that we can discuss another time, the Gnostic interpretation of this is, and, and this is what even in Europe, the Cathars and the Albigensians are, you know, in relatively contemporary time, there were opposition to the Catholic